Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Francisco Quintana, who is a professor of neurology at the Center for Neurologic Diseases at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and an associate member at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. His research investigates signaling pathways that control the immune response and neurodegeneration with the ultimate goal of identifying novel therapeutic targets and biomarkers for immune-mediated disorders. Welcome, Francisco. Hi, thanks for having me today. Sure, yeah, thanks for doing this. So you have a couple of uh, very recent papers um, that I would love to, I'd love to go through. Uh, the, the, the first one is uh, gut-licensed interferon gamma cells drive anti-inflammatory astrocytes. Um, you say astrocytes are uh, glia- glial cells that are abundant in the cellular nervous system and that have important homeostatic and disease-promoting functions. How little is known about the homeostatic anti-inflammatory activities of astrocytes and their regulation. Uh, before we get into the details of this, Francisco, um, what exactly are astrocytes? So it's actually an interesting question, right? Because if I were to ask you, what is the most abundant cell in your brain? Most likely you would tell me the neuron, right? Yes. Yet yet the most abundant cells in the brain are astrocytes. Hmm. They got that name because they look like stars when you look at them in the microscope, under the microscope. And, you know, for years they were so abundant and they were just kind of thought to be glue, literally. They were thought to be some kind of, you know, providers for neurons to do their things. However, nowadays we realize that these cells being so abundant are not just passive bystanders, right? They they are very important for our the, the functioning of our brain and spinal cord, what we call this the central nervous system, you know, in health. And also they are very important drivers of neurologic diseases. So here you go, you have the most abundant cell in the CNS and yet you don't know what it does. <laughs> yeah, so, so as you say, uh, everybody uh, knows about new, the neurons um, and their importance, um, but y- you have this microglia and macroglia cells, right, in the brain. So astrocytes is sort of a, a, a glial cell? Exactly, when you think about glial cells, from the brain, you yeah. think about microglia, you think about which are kind of macrophages, right? These are cells that eat up stuff around them. Mm. Then you have another cell type, which is called oligodendrocyte, which what it does, it, it produces, it synthesizes the insulation around the neurons, right? You know, the neurons, they have this in- insulation tissue. I mean, what yeah. we call myelin that actually allows them to work. And then the third type of glial cell you have in the brain is the astrocyte. That's why sometimes you will hear they are referred to as astroglia. 
I see. Okay. And so, so what do we know? I, I know that, you know, uh, we have learned a lot last uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, what do we know currently about their function uh, of, uh, of astrocytes in the brain? Okay. So, you know, the easiest thing to do is to think about what they do in health and what they do in disease, right? Yeah. So in health, first of all, during development, they will guide, you know, neurons extend these axons, right? These kind of like extensions. So astrocytes will guide those axons. In addition, yeah. astrocytes will also guide the formation of a series of membranes that kind of wrap all the central nervous system and they are called the meninges, the mm -hmm. blood brain barrier. That is tightly controlled. Uh, the blood brain barrier is tightly controlled by the astrocytes. And then also what astrocytes do is they provide nutrients, they provide growth factors for neurons to do well, right? Mm. And also you might know that neurons, you know, they communicate by secreting uh, chemicals, right? That mm. are produced by one neuron and then they are sensed by another neuron. So astrocytes can regulate the secretion and, and uptake of those chemicals. And by doing so, they can actually regulate synaptic communication, neuron to neuron communication. So then they can have important roles in behavior, for example, in memory. Mm. Now, that's part of kind of like what we call homeostatic, right? Like functions of astrocytes in health. Yeah. In the context of disease, they, first of all, they can stop doing all of that, right? And obviously that creates problems that boost what we call neurodegeneration, which is just neuronal death. Yeah. And on top of that, they can actually drive inflammation within the brain, which, as you can imagine, is very bad. And literally, they can secrete molecules that uh, kill neurons. And that is even a stronger driver of neurodegeneration. So, so is it correct, uh, Francisco, to think about sort of the neurons is, is like the hardware and the astrocytes, uh, through a variety of functions that you described, it provides energy, nutrients, uh, it, it regulates the communication. So astrocytes is sort of like the software. <laughs> is that the right way to think about it? Oh, up to a certain extent. I would say that both neurons, astrocytes, and all the other glial cells, right? Yeah. They are kind of a, a hardware which has, each one has its own programs. Yeah. You know, it's on software, but what is important to understand is that all the consequences uh, of the function of the central nervous system, they result from the interactions and communication between all those different parts of hardware. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the important thing to put where the field has been for years is that for years we've focused on the neurons as the main source of program, you know, of function. But now we need to zoom out a little bit and start to see what all those other cells and the, their communication, uh, what do they do in order to produce what we know as the functions of the central nervous system? Yeah, so, so, so given that they have a very important set of functions uh, that, that affects the neuron's ability to, 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 to work, um, so any deficiency in them, um, in the construction, is it's an expected sort of a ratio of astrocytes to neurons uh, in the brain? There is a certain ratio. It, it could change in different areas, right? And the other thing you have to keep in mind is that, you know, we talk about uh, astrocytes as we talk about humans, right? Yet, we know that there are multiple subsets or classes or types of astrocytes, the same way that there's different types of people. Yeah. So that's very important. It's not only that the changes in the ratios might change between uh, neurons and astrocytes, but then specific subsets might change. And, and that's important because that's something for which we know really very little. Mm. And so it's not one thing, it, it's sort of many, many different things. And uh, I would imagine these different categories all have different functions. And, and you mentioned uh, this, uh, the idea of inflammation. So the, the astrocytes uh, have an important role to play in inflammation. 
Exactly, but it's even better in the sense that, uh, you know, I was saying that there are different subsets of astrocytes. So there are actually subsets that can promote and boost and drive inflammation. There are subsets that can actually suppress it. Mm. So again, it's the balance between these two subsets and obviously additional subsets of other cells that eventually control this big thing that we call inflammation in the CNS. Mm. Um, is it correct to think about inflammation as sort of a defensive mechanism the body has to, to sort of take care of an injury or something like that? Oh, for sure. That's a very good way to put it. Yeah. Indeed, inflammation is part of many uh, natural processes, right? Just to give you two clear examples, one is when we fight off pathogens, right? Yeah. The other one is wound healing. Both of them involve certain types and certain degrees of inflammation. So the problem is that sometimes those mechanisms get out of control, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and then I think nowadays, for example, we hear a lot how the inflammatory response associated, for example, with SARS-CoV-2 infection can get out of control and then you have this cytokine storm, right? And complications. So this is the way we should think, for example, about inflammation in the brain. It plays uh, a certain role, but if uh, unleashed with no type of control, then you have pathogenesis, then you have disease. Yeah, uh, since you mentioned, uh, mentioned it, I want to take a quick detour, uh, Francisco. So what is our current understanding of COVID, COVID's effects on the brain? Is it, is it the virus directly affecting the brain or is it something? So that's, that's really a very rapidly and very new area. Yeah. So new papers are coming out suggesting that that's the case, that the virus might target some cells in the brain. But I think this is the type of things where we need to wait a little bit to see how uh, strong are those findings and how much they are replicated, right, by different investigators. The, the symptoms such as loss of smell and brain fog, things that are associated with long COVID, as you say, as they say, uh, appears to have sort of a CNS driven things, right? Yeah, that exactly. I mean, they are clearly what you call like these cognitive symptoms, right? That suggests that there's some intra CNS process going on, or at least some that some damage has been done, right? And has to be uh, repaired. And indeed, you know, it's interesting that that's associated not only with SARS-CoV-2, but has been linked to other uh, viral infections, even starting with uh, influenza. So it's something that has to be studied. And I know about a couple of large efforts being put together as a way of addressing what, you know, at the end of the day, we like to understand what is the mechanism, where is that brain fog coming from, yeah. as a way of trying to see how to intervene therapeutically, right? right. So, as I said, I know about uh, some big studies being uh, developed literally to address that. Yeah. Uh, so going back to the, the inflammation of the brain and astrocytes role in it, um, since we have the blood-brain barrier, not not pathogens typically don't get in there. So, what is what is the cause of inflammation in the brain? Oh, there could be. First of all, there could be many types of inflammation, and there could be many causes, right? Yeah. One typical uh, cause is an infection, and and but mostly in the context of autoimmune diseases, right? Yeah. What happens, and, and the clear example I can give you is a disease called multiple sclerosis, right. where somehow, uh, and, and you know, the trigger, it's, it's a matter of discussion. We can talk about it later. Yeah. But somehow the, um, the immune system, which is, you know, our system that fights off pathogens and tumors and stuff like that, somehow starts to uh, attack the brain. So it's our own body. Mm that T, T cells in particular, right, which are uh, what we call T cell lymphocytes, yeah. they actually make it into the CNS. They cross the BBB, as you said, and they start to, particularly in the context of multiple sclerosis, they start to destroy myelin, which is this insulation wrapped around axons. And when myelin is gone, then uh, first axons are gone, then neurons are gone, 
and then you have this uh, accumulation of neuronal loss, right? What we call new degeneration. Yeah. That, as you can imagine, eventually results in significant uh, neurological uh, disabilities. Yeah, so you have another paper in that area. So let me bring that into the discussion also. It is, you say, is MAFG-driven astrocytes promote CNS inflammation? And this is about multiple sclerosis. You say it's a chronic inflammatory disease of the CNS. Astrocytes contribute to the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis but little is known about the heterogeneity of astrocytes and its regulation. Um, so, so you mentioned, so the, the, the T cells that you mentioned, they, they, they're not supposed to be there, right? They, so they, they get in um, through some mechanism that we don't know? Exactly. So uh, in the healthy brain, right, we do not expect many T cells to be there, and in particular the type of T cells that can cause uh, damage to the CNS. Yeah. Now, why is it that they get to the CNS in MS patients? There are multiple theories, right? Yeah. One is whether there's a virus or several viruses that can kind of hyperactivate the immune system, right? And then the immune system gets confused and instead of fighting the virus, fights or attacks the CNS. And you know, the candidates, they've been for years, there have been many candidates. One of the candidates is a virus called Epstein-Barr, which is quite common mm. and and the idea is in some individuals and, and this is a theory right there's some data supporting it but i wouldn't say it's it's the only uh, theory that has been put forward however one uh, one of the thoughts out there is that um in some individuals uh because of their genetic background because of the stuff they've been exposed to through their lives right yeah they um the immune system starts to fight to attack, to attack the this virus, the Epstein Barr, and then eventually gets confused and attacks the brain. Yeah, and so so the multiple sclerosis uh, disease state. Uh, so is is it really emanating from such a process? Well, that's one of the theories, yeah. and and that's what we kind of believe. There is a combination between genetics, because there is a genetic component, right? Yeah. But also environment. And in the environment, you know, so far there are factors associated with the diet, with the commensal flora, what we call the microbiome, right? Uh, environmental factors such as, uh, you know, exposure to sunlight or exposure to specific uh, pollutants that we think all of them or each one of them a little bit seem to contribute to um, the development of MS. So, so, so since it's an autoimmune, perhaps an incorrect autoimmune response of the body, uh, so can you suppress that uh, somehow and that, that will have some beneficial effects? I would say yes and no. So we have, so the problem is that, first I'll tell you the challenge and then I tell you where we are now. Yeah. So um the challenge is that you know that's kind of how we know that the disease gets started right you get these t cells these immune cells that get to the brain and start to cause problems the problem is that you know that's that goes on for years right mm -hmm. but then uh as you have these inflammatory cells in this in the brain they start to trigger inflammation and they start to activate or induce inflammatory responses mm -hmm in other cell types, for example, in astrocytes. So you had an astrocyte or a set of astrocytes that were relatively quiet doing their thing. Yeah. They were exposed to T cells and other stuff. And now out of the blue, they start to produce these um, pathogenic, right? Disease promoting molecules. Mm. So, uh, so that's a problem. The disease changes, the type of inflammation changes uh, with the curse of the disease. So, so far they have been um, and they are in the market, uh, therapies that are quite efficient and very good at controlling these initial stages of the disease or these stages where the disease pathogenesis is mostly driven by T cells, right? Yeah. However, uh, we lack efficacious methods to suppress, to turn off inflammation driven 
by these different mechanisms, by astrocytes, by microglia, that's something that's still on the works. Okay. And so, so it becomes sort of a run, run away mechanism, is it? So, so T cells starts, uh, T cells started and then astrocytes and other microglia cells um, essentially get confused in some sense. So they have their own responses and it, it sorts of add up like that. It's like a run process. Exactly, it's like bringing a torch to a to a woods, <laughs> right? To the forest. Initially, you know, you have your own, that fire that is well defined, but then eventually you start to have more fires around you, and then obviously it becomes harder to control. Yeah, yeah. And so, what is your lab um, doing in this area? What is sort of our best best uh, approach to this? Um, you know, th this type of a situation. So what we have done is we are actually, first of all, we're studying astrocytes and trying to identify the different subsets, right? Because if they are what we would call astrocytes that in the context of multiple sclerosis, right? Yeah. They promote disease, but some of other, but some other subsets kind of arrest disease. Mm. Obviously, first you want to identify them and then you want to be able to identify what you can target therapeutically in each one of those target subsets because you want to keep happy and active those astrocytes that are suppressing inflammation, while at the same time you, you want to have or find a way to specifically deactivate those that are causing problems. So what my lab does yeah. is it applies uh, advanced uh, genomic methods in order to identify different astrocyte subsets mm and the molecular, the genetic mechanisms that control them. And then when I talk about mechanisms, we work with how pollutants, how the gut flora, how metabolism, how each one of those factors can control astrocytes. And then the second thing we have done is uh, we know that, as I mentioned, the behavior, right? The outcome of what happens when you have inflammation in the CNS, is driven by multiple cell interactions, astrocytes talking to neurons, to microglia, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. So one of the focuses of the lab is actually to develop novel tools and approaches to understand not only cells in, a, in isolation, yeah. but actually the mechanisms of communication. What is this language they speak? And again, trying to understand how that language had communication controls behavior and how we can potentially exploit it therapeutically. The, um, the, the different types of astrocytes, uh, could you create them artificially? So that's a good question. People have been trying to do that. You know, probably you heard about stem cells, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so people has working, first of all, you can generate astrocyte-like cells in vitro, right? Yeah. But there's always a context, the question, and there's data suggesting that those cells that you can get to grow happily in culture, right? They are not as, they do not completely resemble the complexity and the diversity, either in terms of uh, appearance and function of astrocytes in vitro. And that has to do with the fact that when an astrocyte is in vivo, right, in the brain, yeah. Its environment is so different. It's interacting with other astrocytes in a specific 3D uh, organization. It's talking with different cell types. Um, so, so, but so far, that's how far we've gotten. You know, how 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 far we've got. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know much about this, Francisco. Is is it um, is it correct to think about? So, so there is obviously specialization in astrocytes in the brain. And when you get them from the stem cells, um, you, you're not getting the diversity, you're not getting the specialization. If you were to introduce them into the brain, they, they will almost lack sort of the language abilities uh, to communicate with the system. <laughs> sort of. That's, I mean, that's, an, that's a way to put yeah. it. Uh, and, and that's one of the limitations. Obviously, you know, the field is changing, is changing rapidly. But that's one thing you have to keep in mind, that when you differentiate them in vitro or when you work in vitro, um, uh, you are prone to have artifacts, right? That's the way we refer to it. Yeah. So 
look, as long as you are aware of it and then you're aware of the limitations of those astrocytes and systems, you can still move forward. Yeah, so this um, one of the important functions, it's, it looks to me that astrocytes is sort of keeping the brain homeostatic. It's doing a lot of different things. When things go in one direction, it can pull it back uh, to make it more stable. Um, is it uh, so the, the sort of the critical ratios between these categories, I would imagine is important to keep that homeostatic balance of the brain, right? Is that the issue? Yeah, that's, that's actually right. So there are different uh, ratios and, you know, that's kind of one of the questions we're trying to address, right? Are different subsets doing different functions? Yes or no? There are lots of very interesting questions to address there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so in conclusion, um, Francisco, yeah, I know that you're doing, your lab is doing a lot of work in this area. Um, we have learned a lot, uh, last 10 years, last 10 years. Uh, what do you think uh, sort of the most interesting avenues uh, in this general area? Where we will make the most, um, you know, biggest, um, biggest discoveries in the next five years? So I think one of the most interesting areas would be to understand how different subsets of astrocytes and different cells, how they are located in the brain. Because remember, this is very different from studying cells in the blood, right? Yeah. You are in the brain, that's a well-organized structure. And only now we're starting to get the tools to see these different subsets and even analyze the genomic control in situ, right, in, in different areas. So location is going to be very important. Communication is going to be very important to understand how they talk to each other, right? And then the last thing I would say is regulation. Uh, so one of the interesting findings we are making in the lab is that you can identify different ways by which the microbiome, for example, can control them, either by secreting metabolites, right, that travel all the way from the gut to the brain, yeah. or by educating cells that, again, travel all the way from the gut to the brain. That's central because that's very important for our physiology. And the final point I want to make, and the final point we're investigating in the lab, is how you go from these findings in one specific disease to other conditions. So for example, in the lab, we're interesting, interested on how these things we're finding and these new tools we are developing in MS, right? In the context of multiple sclerosis, sclerosis they also apply for brain tumors, for uh, brain infections, for neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's disease or AD. Yeah. When we think about uh, neurons, we think about neurons firing. So when you, when you image the brain, uh, can you actually see the activities of the astrocytes? Yeah, people have built what we call reporter mice, right? Which has uh, systems that allow to monitor interact activation and that has been shown to happen. That's pretty exciting, actually. It's nice to, to watch those, to see those photos <laughs> and movies. Yeah, it seems like that's going to be quite a critical tool, right? Because you, you are saying the sort of the organization, the spatial organization of the different categories are going to be quite important in understanding it. So as technology develops further there, I think that might accelerate the field. Yeah, and indeed, you know, what, what one of the big uh, changes or, or, or challenges will be to integrate right, those, uh, as you were saying, like monitoring activation, right, in situ, right, in different areas of the brain, to integrate it with what we call outcomes, right, with, I don't know, disease progression to cognitive impairment. That, that's one of the most challenging things, yet one of the most exciting things also. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Francisco. Thank, thanks so much for uh, spending time with me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.
www.sbscom